a start. Today uh, I was explaining that it's British weather, you know, where we get a little bit of rain for a long time. This is exactly the type of weather we get very often in Britain. Yeah? Um, you can see from this list, which is getting longer and longer, that we have actually covered a huge amount of uh, work in the last couple of weeks. And what we've done is we've developed a lot of tools for dealing with crystallography. And today we are going to deal with the last part of the tools. And next week we will focus mainly on the application to martensitic transformations and to interfaces. Uh, and martensitic transformations, by that I mean uh, something much more general than just martensite. You can include any displacive transformation, for, a, for example, bainite or weedman staten ferrite, etc. So today's lecture is going to focus on something known as a correspondence matrix, and then also how to factorize the deformation into a pure deformation and a rigid body rotation. You'll remember that a pure deformation is a deformation which leaves three mutually perpendicular directions unrotated, but they may be distorted. Okay. Now here's a, an illustration of a vector 1, 1 in the basis A, which as a consequence of deformation becomes this vector here. And if I represent this vector, the blue vector, in this basis, then it would have different indices. Yeah. So after deformation, this crystal structure becomes this crystal structure, and the vector 2, 1 in crystal B has its origins in the vector 1, 1 in crystal A. Yeah? So this vector was generated by deformation of this vector in crystal A. It's important to note that this vector is not equal to this. Okay, it's, it's quite different. But the fact is that it originated from vector 1, 1 in crystal A. So we say that 2, 1 in crystal B corresponds to 1, 1 in crystal A. Okay? So for example, if you are waiting for a bus, okay, and you get onto the bus, and you can identify that this position in the bus comes from this position in the queue, then you say these are corresponding positions. Right? Similarly, this vector corresponds to this vector in crystal A. You deformed the 1, 1 vector in A in order to generate the 2, 1 vector in B. That's the meaning of correspondence. Yeah? You happy with that? It would be convenient to define a matrix which allows us to identify which plane and which direction came from austenite when we formed the ferrite. Doesn't mean that those planes and directions are parallel or equal. Simply means that you, know, you generated the 110 plane in ferrite by deformation of the 111 plane in austenite. So how do you think we could do this? derive such a matrix. Okay. So I, I've physically described to you the operations needed. Yeah. First of all, obviously, we've got to deform, right? And then how do I obtain these indices? The deformation will give me the blue vector. So the first operation is simple. We've got to have a deformation matrix. How then do I obtain these indices? We should set new reference in the deform matrix. Correct, correct. So we do a coordinate transformation, basically. Yeah, because this vector is exactly the same as this, but the deformation leaves it in the basis A. We then do a coordinate transformation, and therefore we get its indices in basis B. So a correspondence matrix will be a deformation followed by a coordinate transformation. Right? So the vector 2, 1 in B comes from the deformation of 1, 1 in A. So we say that 2, 1 corresponds to 1, 1, but it's not equal to 1, 1. So it's very simple, you know. The correspondence matrix, which I've written with a capital C, is simply the deformation of the vector here. P is a strain because, look, the basis symbols are the same on both sides. And then do a coordinate transformation into the other crystal. Yeah? 
So the combination of a coordinate transformation and a deformation gives you the correspondence matrix. So the indices here will not be the same as the indices here. Okay, so the, this is just an example. The T stands for a twin and the M stands for the matrix. So these are twin related crystals. And when I deform the 0, 0, 1 of the matrix, it becomes the 1, 1, 4 uh, of the matrix. But its coordinates in the twin are 1 bar 1, 0. So this vector here corresponds to this vector in the matrix. OK? Is everybody happy about the correspondence matrix? Yeah? So you know, when we did the Bain strain, what does the 1, 0, 0 uh, of the ferrite correspond to in the austenite? Where did the 1, 0, 0 of ferrite come from in the austenite? 1, 1, 0. Yeah, it's actually 1 bar 1, 0, but you're, you're right. Yeah. OK, now, now we move to a, a rather more difficult topic, which is uh, how to take the square root of a matrix, OK? The square root of a matrix. You've never come across that, right? But we are going to do it today. First of all, just to revise uh, what we did in the last lecture, uh, this is a deformation matrix which clearly is symmetrical, OK? And whenever you see a deformation matrix which is symmetrical, that means it's a pure strain. Involves, uh, it ha you can always find three mutually perpendicular axes, uh, eigenvectors, which are unrotated. So a pure strain has a symmetrical matrix. And this could be referred to any set of axes, and it would remain symmetrical. But if we refer the matrix to the eigenvectors, then this would become a diagonal matrix. That means everything except uh, the diagonal terms would be 0. So when we did the matrix for the Bain strain, we only had eta 1, eta 2, and eta 3, and everything else was 0, because the Bain strain was defined with respect to the principal axes. Okay? So it's referred to, uh, it can be referred to the principal axes, and in which case this would become a diagonal matrix. That means all these terms would be 0. And of course, the principal axes are unrotated by the deformation. Uh, they are parallel to the eigenvectors. The volume change is simply given by the determinant of this matrix. And in the case of the Bain strain, that was simply eta 1, eta 2, eta 3. OK. Uh, that was an incorrect animation. That was, should have been there first, OK? Right. Uh, how, do we, um, how do we try and get the square root of this? Well, first of all, uh, let's uh, find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. Because in order to make it diagonal, we have to express it on the axes which correspond to the eigenvectors. Okay? Um, when once we have a diagonal matrix, it's easy to take a square root. So here's our matrix. The first thing is to find the eigenvalues. All right? That means the distortions along the principal axes. And you do that by writing this determinant. And that gives you a, a cubic equation in lambda when you, when you, you know, take this, multiply by this, minus this, and so on. You get a cubic equation in lambda. And the numbers I've chosen here so that uh, you know, it's very simple to get the eigenvalues. It's not generally this simple. But you know, if you search uh, Google for calculator for eigenvalues of a matrix, you'll be able to do this online. Okay? Uh, so here's a cubic equation. And clearly, you know, we have uh, three eigenvalues, 12, 30, and 18. We then uh, substitute uh, each one of these eigenvalues into this equation multiplied by uh, u1, u2, u3. And we get three equations, so we are able to solve for the vector u. All right? And then we substitute lambda, lambda 2 into the same set of equations, and we get the second eigenvector and the third eigenvector. Okay? Now, once we've got these eigenvectors, uh, and we express them as unit vectors here, so this is uh, this 2, 1, 1, 
di divided by the magnitude of 211 gives me a unit vector. So I'm now going to express this matrix in a frame of reference which consists of these three eigenvectors. Okay, how can I do that? Yeah, you did the right motions, but tell me. Yeah, you, you are right. Go, go ahead and tell us how. Yeah, uh, and and the what, what is the expression we use to describe that operation? Yeah, to express a deformation in a different frame of reference. What do we call that operation? No, no, co coordinate transformation is different. Uh, it simply changes the reference axes. What we want to do is describe the deformation in a different frame of reference. Hmm? No, no. We did this in the last lecture. So we are doing the same deformation, but in a different... Somebody said it, I think. Sis, did you say similarity? Yeah. So you remember the similarity transformation where you have the deformation matrix, you multiply by the coordinate transformation matrix and it's inverse on the other side. Yeah? Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah? So look, um, supposing uh, this is our deformation and I want to express it in a coordinate system B, then I multiply that by B, J, A, oh sorry, you see, I've made a mistake, and I can immediately recognize I've made a mistake. AJB into BJA equals BSB. Okay. A coordinate transformation is when I have a vector So the vector is not changing at all, it's just being expressed in a different frame. Yeah. So this is the similarity transformation. Everyone happy with that? If I want to express the deformation in a different frame of reference, I do it by a similarity transformation, right? Okay, uh, in, my, in, in this case, uh, I, I want to express the deformation ASA in a frame of reference which consists of the eigenvectors. Okay. So I will form my coordinate transformation matrix using these eigenvectors here. Okay. So here you are. Um, this is our, our matrix and here is exactly this equation that I've written. Here's the matrix. And this is a row vector corresponding to the first eigenvector, row vector corresponding to the second one, and W2, et cetera, uh, is, is this, okay? And this is the transpose of this because these are unit vectors, all right? So the inverse is the transpose, right? Do you remember that? And when I do that, I get uh, a matrix which is diagonal, okay? That means all the other terms are zero. And just to identify that it's a diagonal matrix, I've put a, a bar on top, okay? So any symmetrical matrix which is expressed in the coordinates of the eigenvectors will only cause stretching and contraction along the principal axes, yeah? So if I multiply this now by 1, 0, 0, it becomes 18, 0, 0. That means it's parallel but it's not rotated, yeah? yeah? I mean, it's distorted, but it's not rotated, yeah? Because parallel and not being rotated is the same, <laughs> okay? And if I multiply by 0, 1, 0, again, the 0, 1, 0 remains in the same direction, and 0, 0, 1. Whereas if I do that with this, then 1, 0, 0 becomes 18, 6, minus 6. So that's no longer a principal axis. So this is referred to a different set of coordinates. Everybody happy with that? Now, I've got this matrix. What do you think is the square root of that matrix?
Yeah, you're, you're, I think you know. Yeah, so if I just did the square root of every number in there, yeah, then that's the square root of that matrix because if I multiply that matrix, the square root of that matrix by itself, then it gives me this one, right? So if I write a matrix in which all these numbers are square roots, then that's the square root of this matrix because when I multiply it by the square root, I get the answer, yeah? So in order to take the square root, you first diagonalize it, yeah? then take the square root, and then express it back into the original uh, coordinate system, which is this. Yeah? So the reason why I diagonalize the matrix is I want to take the square root, okay? but that's, that's not really the frame of reference I'm interested in. It's this frame of reference I'm interested in. So then I do a similarity transformation back into A. Yeah? I can't take the square root of this. It doesn't make sense. Okay? Do you see? It's quite a, a clever trick. I think. Okay? <laughs> so, in order to take the square root, I diagonalize the matrix. So, the square root is simply Square root 18, 30, and 12. And that, that is uh, to the half. Yeah. Because if I multiply that matrix by itself, I get BSP. But really, I'm working in this frame of reference for whatever reason. So I then take this square root and do a similarity transformation back into A. And that gives me the square root of this matrix. OK, you happy with that? OK. Yeah, so there, there we go. Um, this is our matrix, which is diagonal. So it's identified by a bar. And this is the square root of the diagonal matrix. Uh, I've already explained this to you, that you know, if, if I have a symmetrical matrix and I know its eigenvectors, then I transform it into a diagonal matrix uh, by, by doing the similarity transformation. And then take the square root of that diagonal matrix and similarity transform it back into the original basis to get the square root of that. Okay. Right. Now, you might wonder, you know, why are we doing this? Yeah? So let's, let's see. So here's uh, the, some familiar deformations. Uh, this is uh, our uh, dilatation normal to the habit plane here, the, the uh, invariant plane. This is the shear, and this is the uh, general invariant plane strain. Which one of these is a pure deformation? The first one. The first one because you can see that Z1 is unrotated, Z3 is unrotated, and the one coming out of the plane of the board is unrotated. And anyway, just by looking at the matrix, you can see that it's a pure deformation because that's a symmetrical matrix, right? But these are not. These are not pure deformations. You can see these are not symmetrical matrices. In other words, you can factorize this into a uh, pure deformation which involves just extension and contractions and a rigid body rotation. Okay? So let's, let's uh, do that. So just to illustrate, and I always get this diagram uh, not quite right. This is our simple shear. And that is not a pure deformation, but if I rotate this diamond, this diamond shape,
Okay. So I've rotated it. Then you can see this becomes a pure deformation because there's that axis is stretched and that axis is contracted without rotation, right? And the rotation is by that angle. So you can decompose a general deformation into a combination of a pure deformation and a rigid body rotation. And this, this part of it will give you a symmetrical matrix. And the other part will not be a symmetrical matrix. OK? So let, let's uh, do that. OK, this is uh, the same thing illustrated differently where we treat the original uh, square as a sphere, okay? And the shear transforms it into an ellipse, yeah? And this is our invariant plane. And you can see that there is no axis which is, uh, uh, you know, you can't find three axes which are un unrotated. But if I turn this ellipse through a particular angle here, then we get these stretches and contractions, yeah? So this is the pure strain part of the simple shear. So here's our simple shear again. And we can decompose it into a pure deformation and a rigid body rotation. Now, this is actually a bodily rotation. So it's like a strain. And that's why the basis symbols are the same on each side. Now, what I want you to do is think a little bit about uh, this factorization that I've taken ZPZ and written it as a rotation and a pure strain. Is that, is that a unique factorization? OK, so this is a very important point. Is that the only way I could factorize that into a rigid body rotation and a pure deformation? So you only need to think about the equation, right? Not even the diagrams. And it's also very important when we do Martin Seidig uh, transformation theory. So just think mathematically, is this, is this a unique factorization? Why not? You're right. In the pure deformation matrix, we can choose the eigenvectors, the order of eigenvectors. OK, but that doesn't change the nature of the deformation. Hmm? OK, is this a unique factorization of the matrix A? Just think mathematically into two matrices, one of which is a pure strain, and the other one is a rigid body rotation. Hmm? Yeah, why, why is that? You don't even need to think about deformations. Just think about the equation. determinant of one of the two matrices S0, then I can get the infinite set of the solution? That's too complicated. Okay. There's a very, very simple answer. Yeah. You mean that we can switch? Correct, correct. So why, why can't I write, uh, you know, uh, C? Yeah, first the rigid body rotation and then the pure strain. And that will be different. Yeah. When you change the order of multiplication, you don't get the same answer, right? Yeah? So what we are doing is just something in our brain. It's not a real effect. We are not actually doing first a rigid body rotation and then 
uh, a pure strain. It's just something to help us to understand what's going on. But you can do the factorization in many different ways. Yeah? I, I, I could divide the pure strain into many components, for example. It doesn't mean that I'm actually physically doing the deformation first and then the rigid body rotation. Do you, do you understand? Yeah? This is just a mathematical trick to help us to solve problems. And that's why the crystallographic theory of Martinsight is called the phenomenological theory of Martinsight. That means it tells you how to get from one state to the other, but the path that is described, uh, you have to provide some evidence for that. Okay? So I chose to have the rotation first and pure strain later, but I could have done it the other way around. Okay, so what I want to do is separate this into two components. So first of all, uh, I, I uh, want to diagonalize this uh, matrix. So what I do is I create a symmetrical matrix by multiplying it by its transpose. Yeah, so if I take ZPZ and multiply it by its transpose, then that's the same as this being multiplied by this. The transpose of this is this. Yeah? Now, can you, can you explain what ZJ dash Z times ZJ Z is? So, so you don't know the answer here, okay? <coughs> so this is, a, this is a rotation, and this is the transpose of this matrix. What does that give me? Identity. Yeah, because, because uh, the transpose is equivalent to uh, uh, the inverse. So this simply becomes one and we create this matrix here, which will be a symmetrical matrix. Yeah. So now all I have to do is diagonalize this okay, by uh, finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and expressing uh, this matrix yeah. diagonalized. Once I've diagonalized, I can take its square root, so I get z q z, okay? And then I express it back into the original frame of reference, not the eigenvectors, and I've got z q z. Once I've got z q z, that's easy to find, because we know this, yeah? So if I just multiply both sides, by ZQZ to the minus one, then I get the rigid body rotation. Yep. So that was the reason for looking at how to find the square root of a matrix. Is everybody happy with that? So you can factorize it into a pure strain, which will be this diamond shape here and a rigid body rotation. So let's, let's uh, look at a further example. So on this side, we have the hexagonal closed-packed uh, crystal structure. And th on this side, we have the cubic closed-packed. In other words, what you normally call as face-centered cubic. All right? And these are the closed-packed planes here, the 1, 1, 1 planes. And these are the closed-packed planes of the hexagonal. That means the 0, 0, 0, 1 planes. And the stacking sequence here is A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. It repeats every three layers. Yeah. You know, in other words, if you take the, the magnitude of a lattice vector parallel to 1, 1, 1 and divide by the spacing of those planes, you'll get 3. In other words, the repeat period along 1, 1, 1 is 3, and therefore the sequence is A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. On this side, uh, the repeat sequence is A, B, A, B, A, B. So how do we convert from this to this? Yeah, um, you, you're, exact, you're right if I, if I shear this so that every second layer 
moves to the other position, then I generate the HCP because this, this is the same sequence as this, but I need to correct this layer so that it goes to A. Okay? So every second layer we have to shear the material. And when we look at this macroscopically, it's like a homogeneous deformation. But microscopically, it's happening on every second layer. And does anybody know what kind of dislocation would do that? There's a special name for it. The Shockley partial dislocation. Because to change the crystal structure, the dislocation cannot have a Burgers vector, which is a lattice vector. Because if it's a lattice vector, then you go from an identical position to another identical position, yeah? Where the environment is exactly the same. So the Shockley partial just moves from here to here, these adjacent bumps. And that's not a lattice vector. Um, OK, this is just the same thing illustrated again, uh, that we have here the close back plane of the um, austenite, if you like, and this is the epsilon ion. And the displacement direction is along the 112. So if I, if I look at a close back plane, then it's got bumps here where the next layer can sit. And there, there are two, if this is the A position, then this is the B position, C position, where the next layer can sit. Okay? And if I go from uh, this C position to this C position, I haven't changed anything. I've just accomplished slip. But if I go from this C position to this B position, then I've changed the stacking sequence. And this is the vector here, which describes that displacement, which is A by 6, 2, 1, 1. If I do another displacement, then of course it becomes a lattice vector, which is A by 2, 1, 1, 0. Okay. So if I move a Shockley partial dislocation on every second plane, then you change from austenite to epsilon ion. Epsilon ion is hexagonal close packed. This is not the complete description of the transformation from austenite to epsilon ion, because there's also a volume change. Right? We are here a shear doesn't involve a volume change. Which one is denser? Is it austenite or epsilon ion? Which one? Epsilon ion. Yeah. How, how do you know that? Yeah, you are right. High pressure. Correct, yeah. So right in the center of the Earth, there's a huge chunk of iron, which is probably epsilon iron, because the pressure is very, very high. And pressure favors the, low, uh, the high density form. Okay? So even though the temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin right in the center, the pressure is sufficient You know, if you do a first principles calculation to show that it should be epsilon iron, which is stable. OK? So, so it's not actually liquid right in the center because of the pressure. There's a, there's a solid chunk followed by liquid. Okay. So we can describe this transformation as a shear deformation, a simple shear. And this is the, the OK, uh, going back to this, the displacement is A by 6, 2, 1, 1. the displacement and it occurs every two layers okay so if I divide by the despacing times two of the 111 planes okay that gives me the shear which is eight to the minus a half okay so that's where I got this number from it's the magnitude of a by six one one two divided by the spacing of the 111 planes so this is the plane on which the shear happens. This is the shear direction, and that's the magnitude. So it's easy now to derive the deformation matrix, right? Do you remember? This is an invariant plane strain, and you've got an equation which tells you the deformation matrix for an invariant plane strain. So you just plug in the shear, the plane, and the direction, and you've got this matrix here, OK? This, is, this describes the austenite to epsilon ion transformation uniquely. So this is the deformation caused by that transformation. 
Yeah? OK, so then I factorize it into a pure strain and a rotation. And if I find the rotation axis here, then it's 1 bar 1, 0, which is at 90 degrees to that and to that. And the rotation angle is 10.03 degrees. Okay. So if I, if I look, at, um, look at the simple shear, that means the ZPZ, then this is the plane on which that shear occurs and produces this ellipse. Okay. If I then rotate it, that's my pure deformation for the epsilon, uh, austenite to epsilon transformation. And this rotation is at 90 degrees, uh, sorry, is uh, about an axis at 90 degrees to the plane of the board by 10.03 degrees. Okay? And it's about this axis, which is the 110, along which there is no distortion. Yeah, so it's, it's poking, uh, if I, So this is the plane uh, normal to 111. This is the 211 direction. And 110 is poking out of the plane of the board. So there's no, zero, no distortion along, along 110. So we've come up with the correct rotation axis here. Okay. And 10.3 degrees, 10.03 degrees rotation. So this is like the Bain strain of the austenite to ferrite transformation, that we only have a contraction and an expansion along here. Okay. But this won't give me the correct orientation relationship, because to get the correct orientation relationship, I also need this rigid body rotation, which gives me another line which is coherent. Okay. Here, neither of those lines match, even though they're of the same length. All right? But if I add this rigid body rotation, then one of those lines becomes coherent. And I've got another line here which is coherent. So what do two lines which are coherent make? A plane. And which plane is that? Hmm? Yeah, but uh, indices? Uh, you know, it's the 111 plane. Okay. So this, this, this is a, a special Martin Siddick transformation in which you know, it's very easy to get a fully coherent plane between the austenite and the martensite. It's very, very rare. So it doesn't matter how big the particle grows, it will remain fully coherent. And in order for a deformation to give you a plane which is fully coherent, yeah, irrespective of particle size. You can always force coherency when a particle is small. But what I mean is stress-free coherency. One of the distortions must be one. In other words, there is no strain. The other one must be greater than one, and the third one must be less than one. Okay? So the pure strain must be such that eta one is greater than 1, eta 2 is equal to 1, and eta 3 is less than 1. That's the condition for finding a coherent plane between any two crystals. If that is not satisfied, you cannot find a coherent plane. Okay? So we've done this example for FCC to HCP, but this applies to any two crystal structures. If you can deform one structure into another by a deformation which satisfies, by a pure deformation, which satisfies these conditions, then you can find a fully coherent plane. Otherwise, it's impossible. Okay. So that's a very powerful result, you know. If you, you'll find so many papers just making general statements that, you know, this carbide is a bit more coherent than this carbide, and therefore it nucleates first, and so on, with very little substance to support them. Yeah? You can use this kind of a method to see whether that is justified or not, or how far you are away from coherency. Yeah? Because if, if this is close to one, you know, 
then you're likely to grow the particle to a larger size before it loses its coherency. So put some numbers into statements like this, and it becomes a lot more interesting. Yeah. And of course, uh, here we have a particular relationship to find the coherency. In other words, the 111 plane is parallel to 0001. Yeah. And it's obvious that those two planes are coherent anyway, because they are both close packed, right? Everyone happy with that? OK, so we've completed all the sort of uh, tools that we need. And my next lecture will begin on martensitic transformations in much more detail. OK? OK.